Would you take a Bible, dear ones, if you can get hold of one and look at Romans 5 and 21? It's page 981 in that uh, black Bible, Romans 5 and 21. And you can see it's the last verse of the chapter and it summarizes the first section of one of the most important presentations of reality that we have in our world, really. That's what you have to call Romans. And uh, 5 and 21 summarizes it. uh, So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And really it speaks of two forces at work, uh, a force of life and a force of death. And the force of death always works where people live as if there's no God. And the force of life always works where people live as if God is the Father of Jesus. And so what Paul is really saying is, wherever you find death, there has also been right alongside it the power of life. You find that right from the beginning of the world. Wherever men have lived by their own wits, according to their own ideas of knowledge, there has always been death working. Wherever people have really believed there was an infinite wise creator and lived by his guidance, there has always been life. Uh, 1552 uh, in Egypt, 1552 BC, which is about... I suppose, 34, 3,500 years ago. There was a, a book that was the epitome of medical knowledge at that time. And Egypt, of course, was leading every other civilization in, med- in medicine. And uh, the uh, book was uh, called, really, the Ebers, the Papyrus Ebers. And uh, that book has some recommendations for people who are losing hair. And this is the height of uh, mental wisdom uh, that men can produce on their own at that time. When it falls out, one remedy is to apply a mixture of six fats, namely those of the horse, the hippopotamus, the crocodile, the cat, the snake, and the ibex. To strengthen it, anoint with the tooth of a donkey crushed in honey. Now that's as high as medicine at that time could take you. Um, To embedded splinters, they applied worm's blood and ass's dung. Since dung is loaded with tetanus spores, Macmillan says, it is little wonder that lockjaw took a heavy toll of splinter cases. (laughs) Now at the same time, brothers and sisters, as men were living independent of God by their own wits, and therefore you can see obviously spreading death. At that same time, there was a man called Moses in the wilderness desert of Sinai. Not even in the colleges and schools of Egypt, but in a wilderness desert with a little group of nomads following him. And because he was trusting in the creator that really was there, he was given by inspiration a different kind of wisdom. So at the time when that ridiculous kind of witch doctor nonsense was being practiced and was bringing death, Moses was writing things like this. If you look at it in Numbers 19, you'll see it. (coughs) Numbers 19 and verses 14 through 15. And you'll see that he was in fact outlining some of the best laws of hygiene that have ever been devised. Numbers 19, and it's page 133, 133. Numbers 19 and verse 14. This is the law when a man dies in a tent. Everyone who comes into the tent and everyone who is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel which has no cover fastened upon it is unclean. And then uh, he goes on down to 18 and 19. 
Then a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it into the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon all the furnishings and upon the persons who were there and upon him who had touched the bone or the slain or the dead or the grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day. Thus on the seventh day he shall cleanse him and he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and at evening he shall be clean. The amazing thing is that it was these laws of hygiene that were discovered in the 19th century and were used to put at last an end to the terrible infections and plagues that destroyed people's lives in the hospitals in Europe. It was eventually a return to the sprinkling of water that at last put an end to those plagues and infections. So at the same time, brothers and sisters, as men by their own wits were producing this death that we read about in Papyrus Ebers in Egypt, this man was producing by divine revelation and inspiration laws of hygiene which were not accepted by us until 3,300 years later. In fact, there were many doctors who lost their jobs because they were trying to bring this kind of practice into hospitals. New York uh, Department of Health, as usual, was a little behind everybody else. And in 1960, they issued a handbook after 86 of their patients had died in one of the hospitals on the East Coast. They issued a handbook outlining carefully the method to be used in washing hands. And it's almost exactly a copy of the method that Moses detailed in Numbers 3,400 years earlier. Now, that's what I mean when I say wherever there has been this death that has come from living as if there was no God, there has always been this stream of life in our world that has come because people were prepared to believe that there was a God and to trust him. You see, it's the same in our own lives, in our own personal lives, and in our national lives, and our international lives, and our economic lives. There are two forces at work. There's a force of death at work when we live as if there's no God. And there's a force of life that begins to be released into our lives when we live as if there really is a God whom we can trust. And those forces are always coming against one another. Sin is really independence of God. It's really rejecting the idea that there is a creator at all. And what Romans 5 and 21 is saying is wherever you live like that, wherever you live as if there's no God, Sin reigns in death. It sets forth a death that is not only mental and emotional, but it actually becomes physical. But wherever people live in dependence upon God, there is released God's generous power of life. That's what it means by saying His grace. And His grace is released to anyone who receives his righteousness. That is, to anyone who allows God to make him right with themselves through trusting in Jesus' death for them. To them, there is released a power of life. And that's really what Paul is saying throughout the first five chapters. Now you know it is very sophisticated today to say, well, brother, I would believe in God and I would trust him and live that way if I really had enough data to decide that there was a God. But frankly, I haven't enough information. And that's why I live as an agnostic. I'm just not sure that there is a creator to trust. And you may say I'm experiencing death in my own life, but I'm experiencing it through ignorance, not through determined rebellion against this God. Now, brothers and sisters, Paul called that a cop at the beginning of the letter to the Romans. He said, that isn't true. He said, the idea of God is an innate primary truth that most of us are born with. And it's reinforced every time we read ancient history. And every time we look at the universe and see its order and design, it is borne in upon us that there must be a God. And when we read of Jesus and of his resurrection from the dead, we become convinced that there must be a creator. And Paul says... A person who doesn't believe in God is one who has chosen not to believe in God. You remember he puts that in Romans 1 there, if you like to look at it. Romans 1 and 19. Because I think a lot of us like to pretend in a sophisticated way that if we had the information, we would be prepared to believe in God. 
But really, Paul says, no, you have the information if you look at it. It's Romans 1 and 19, page 977. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. I honestly think, brothers and sisters, that most of us are really a bit like old Aldous Huxley. We have enough information to begin to treat God as if he's really there. But we have a vested interest in living our own lives as we want to. We have a vested interest in believing that there is no God. Because we want to live our lives not under someone else's authority, but under our own authority. And the kind of death we first experience, therefore, is the death of mindlessness. That's the first kind of death that sin begins to reign in, in people who reject the idea of God. It's a mindlessness. Because, you see, you have to be educated to reject the idea of God. It is so obvious, the idea of God. It is so plain and obvious. It is so obvious that there must be a being who created all this and who made us like ourselves that you almost have to be perverted intellectually to reject it. And that's what happens. We reject the obvious and our minds become mindless. And that's what Paul is saying, you know, in the next verse, in verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. And that's really the first kind of death that hits you when you refuse to treat God as being a real person. Your mind becomes really confused and illogical. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. And we say to ourselves, you know, no, we couldn't become as ridiculous as that. Until you look at our society. And you see how we are prepared to kill and divorce and murder in order to get another car or in order to get another piece of clothing or another house. Brothers and sisters, when we look at our society, we see a society that is experiencing the death of mindlessness. You know, we let the murderers out a couple of days after we've arrested them and then we hold up our hands in horror because we have such a violent society. Or we fill the mass media with preoccupation with sex and then we are surprised that VD, venereal disease, is on the increase in our society. It's a kind of mindlessness, isn't it? We do what will produce the result and then we stand back horrified and utterly illogical and are surprised that the result comes about. It's the same in our schools, you know it. From high school right on up, we regard the school as a kind of soft, easy place where we divert the children. And so we've softened the whole emotional and intellectual discipline in our high schools, in our colleges, and then we're amazed that our adults seem to be judging things so poorly when they grow up. There's a kind of mindlessness that runs through us. You know. The energy crisis is another example of it. We know fine well there is plenty of oil to be received. If we don't want to hold the prices up there, but we hold the prices up and we'll even cause deaths in hospitals and cause deaths in homes in order to get that greed satisfied. So the first kind of death that begins to spread among people who live as if there's no God is a certain illogicality that begins to run their lives. And you can see that death present in our societies. Now, don't sit there and say, you see, oh, brother, you mean I'm being illogical and I'm being illogical in the rest of my life because I don't trust God. No, but if you look at society, you'll see that that's where it eventually leads you. You have to be illogical to reject the idea of God and that illogicality continues to spread in your life and will eventually ex express itself in your life if it hasn't already. So, first of all, sin reigns in the mindlessness of death. I think there is another problem. When we refuse to acknowledge God as the creator of the world, he is put in an impossible position himself. He's the supreme ruler of the universe. And here are we little flies, and we say we don't believe in you. 
Well, he is obligated himself to accept that rejection and say, well, I can't force you, but I have to reject you also. And so that's really what happens. We reject our creator, and so he gives us up. And that's what Paul says. So God gives us up. And then that results in a terrible sense of vacuum that many of us experience. That's the reason why many of us experience the loneliness of death in our lives today. We reject God, and he gives us up, and suddenly we feel we have nobody that cares. We suddenly begin to wonder why we're here at all. We wonder what place we have here and who put us here because we've rejected the one significant other who did put us here and so we're left in an absolute vacuum and many of us live from day to day in that vacuum. We're strangers among a mass of strangers. We're people who don't know who we are or why we are. We're people who can't find a reason to justify our own existence. And so there comes a great sense of the death of separation and alienation. And you know, loved ones, you know, many of our roommates even are experiencing that terrible loneliness, that terrible sense. What, what is the question that we're, being, we're asking in all our seminars in school? The whole question is, who are we? When I first heard that question, I thought, who are you? Well, check out your passport and you'll know, you know. <laughs> It seemed such a strange question when it first became popular. But you know, that's, that's the popular question. And a deep answer for, uh, for a PhD candidate as to why he's doing his degree is, I'm trying to find who I am. You know? And you feel if he doesn't know who he is, he's in real trouble starting out in a doctorate. But yet, yet that's the point we've come to. You know that. And part of even your slowness to laugh at the thing at first is that we've all been brainwashed into it, isn't it? We, we've, been, we've been taught to believe that's a very intellectual, deep question for a logical person to ask. But it's really a question only that is asked by a person who doesn't believe there's a creator and who doesn't believe there's any purpose in the world. Then he's left in that absolute vacuum and he enters into the death of separation and alienation. And you know you haven't to read many of our playwrights to see that that is the disease that is spreading through our world. A terrible sense of loneliness terrible sense that nobody cares for me. A terrible feeling that there's no reason for me being here. That there's no point in me being here at all. And there is no point apart from a creator. So when you reject a creator, there is no reason for being here. Now you know what that results in. You find yourself in a very vulnerable position. You find yourself one little fly of three and a half billion flies on one of billions of spheres that are whirling through billions of square miles of space. Now that's a pretty insecure position to be in. <laughs> and it's not long before you begin to feel it's an insecure position. And you begin to feel, if I'm to attain my sanity, I must find a reason for being here. I must prove to myself and to everybody else that there's some reason for me being here. I must justify my own existence in some way. And you know what results. We enter into that miserable rat race where we feel we have total responsibility for our marital and our career status. A massive responsibility that we were never made to bear. But we begin to take that as our responsibility. And the result is, we're not made to bear it, so we begin to worry. And we worry, and the old glands in the stomach secrete uh, acid, excess acid, and the acid produces the old ulcers, and the death becomes a physical death. Or we determine we must prove that there's a reason for us being here. We must justify our existence and we enter into that terrible competitive academic or professional world. And we try to beat other people to it. We try to hold other people down. We begin to resent other people who seem to be doing better than we are at proving that they have a right to be here. And the resentment grows up within us into bitterness. And the bitterness begins to produce effects on the blood supply to our brains. It begins to produce effects in our muscles. And we begin to end up with colitis and with heart attacks. And the death again becomes physical. Now, brothers and sisters, that's something of what it means when Paul says, sin reigns in death, you see. Living as if there's no God eventually results in death. Death in a sense of mindlessness that we have, an illogicality and confusion 
an intellectual confusion. Sin in the sense of an alienation from all the other people in the world and a sense of terrible loneliness. And then death in the sense of real physical death as our bodies begin to deteriorate and begin to break under the strain of the psychosomatic diseases. Now, loved ones, here's what Paul is saying. That in the midst of all that, there is a stream of people who do believe that there is a creator and who live as if that creator is really alive. And there are a number of us who have accepted the conclusions of our common sense and we've accepted the conclusions of history and we've accepted the conclusions that we've come to from studying the life of Jesus in the first century. And we do really believe that there is a creator who is what Jesus said, the father of Jesus Christ, and who is loving like Jesus, and is kindly like him. And we've begun to live as if that creator is really alive. And as a result, our minds have come into some grasp of logic and some kind of control of themselves. And so you begin to see that the business of letting murderers out two days after they're arrested is not kindness to the criminal. That's not what law is all about. Law is not uh, concerned with being kind to the person who has done wrong. Law is concerned with upholding God's sense of justice and holiness by exercising a justice itself. And we begin to see that our schools are not there to be a diversion for our kids. They're not there to be a method of get a, getting better paying jobs, but they're there to help us to understand God's plans for bringing the world and the universe under his control. And we begin to see sex, not as a substitute for the exhilaration of that the Holy Spirit alone can bring, but we begin to see it as part of what is a real married relationship. And the mind begins to come into order as we begin to live on the understanding that there is a God who really does love us and care for us. Maybe one of the greatest signs of life is the change it brings in our attitude to ourselves. It's so good, you know, to feel that the creator of the universe really knows you. It is a really exciting to know that he knows my name and that he has numbered the hairs of my head. And suddenly, you know, I don't care what you all think of me. I don't care what the professor thinks of me or what somebody else thinks of me. My creator knows me. He knows me. I'm a son. And he's my father. And I can trust him. And what does it matter what the ratings say? What does it matter whether I'm up or down? If my father thinks out the world of me, he's the only one that counts in the universe. It's hard for even Nixon to have more power than him. And so, <laughs> so there comes a great relaxation in my relationships. I no longer, you know, feel I have to beat all of you down in order to prove myself to myself. I no longer feel I have to scramble to the top of the heap in order to justify my existence. I no longer feel I have to be the best in the world or I have to be like Muhammad Ali, the greatest. I no longer feel that pressure. I feel, Father, you know why I'm here. You know what I'm here for. I, I thank you. And you think the world of me? I don't care what the others think. I'm going to do what you've put me here to do. So there comes a great sense of peace, dear ones. Comes a great sense of peace then in your body as a result of that. Because you're no longer straining. If somebody does something against you, you don't feel the need to bear resentment against them. No. You say, Father, you saw what he did, but I mean, you are in control of my life. You're in control of my failures. You're in control of me losing my job even. You're in control of my failures in examinations. You can work all those things to your plan for me so I don't need to resent them or worry about them or be concerned about them. Father, I thank you that you're in control. And loved ones, there begins to come a great relaxation into your body. And no longer do you toss at night worrying about what's going to happen the next day. Why? Because your father knows it. And he has already made plans about it. You no longer worry about, am I going to get married next year? Will I ever get married? The Father knows he has a plan for you. And you know he's going to work everything according to the counsel of his will. And even when it seems certain that somebody has upset that beautiful plan, it's good to be able to look up and say, Father, to me it seems the whole thing's falling apart, but you know exactly where I'm going. And I know you can work this into the plan. And so, brothers and sisters, there comes a real peace, a real freedom from worry, a real freedom from strain and from resentment and bitterness. 
And really the old body begins to work better. And you begin to find life taking back the death that has begun to spread in your body. And your body begins to experience that life. And really, eventually God has promised that life will overcome death. And death itself actually will be lived through by us because of this power of life within us. Now that's really what Paul is saying, you see. That there are two forces at work today. A force of death at work in those who live as if there's no God, which is an utterly illogical and insane position to undertake. And no human being is made to bear the strain and the pressure that that brings. And a force of life that is released by the Creator if you are prepared to live as if he is really there. And to begin to treat him as a dear father that really does love you. Now, we'll see, you know, in the coming months, and in fact, I suppose the coming years, uh, from chapter 6 on, what this life does inside us when it comes to us. But I think what Paul wants to get home to us now in these first five chapters is, there are two ways to live, and you have to choose which. And I suppose, you know, because I really do love you, I'd ask you, you know, it's hard to speak to you personally, except that God, I think, can make you know that I am speaking to you. But would you really think, brothers and sisters, about it? Would you really decide which way you're living? You know? And don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Don't live that life of strain and stress. Loved ones, there is a God, you know. The arguments are too strong. The order and design of the universe, the existence of Jesus, the innate primary idea you have in your own mind that there's a God. The arguments are too strong. The question really is, will you let him be your God or do you want to be your God? And that's really the issue. And one brings tremendous strain because how can you as God guide your little ship among the other three and a half billion that are trying to guide their ships? And there's a dear father, you know, who knows where your ship ought to go and knows exactly what your life was created for. And he will bring a freedom from strain into that life if you really begin to treat him seriously. So will you, will you think about it? And It really takes a decision. You know. It's not something you waffle into or fall into by osmosis. You really do have to decide, all right, I've been living as if there's no God up to now. I'm going to start living as if God is my heavenly Father. And as if he is like Jesus. And as if he did leave, let Jesus die for me. And really take up an attitude to it in your mind. Let us pray. Dear Father, I would trust you for quiet wisdom and peace to think for each of us this morning. Father, I trust you for brothers and sisters among us who have brainwashed themselves for so long to believe that you do not exist. Father, I would trust you to show them that you respect them and you love them. Father, I would trust you to enable them to deal with the intellectual difficulties and the intellectual problems and to deal with them honestly and then to be prepared to put their life where their head is and to be prepared to put their will where their mouth is and to be prepared to submit to you if they do come to the conclusion that you are God. So, Father, we would pray for each other here in the theatre this morning because we all know the pressures we're under and the subtle forces that have worked within us. And we would pray for each other this morning and pray for clarity of thought and pray for a will that is willing to submit and to obey and to trust and love you. Trust you for these things, our Father, for the sake of my brother.